There's all sorts of uh, theories on how the reggae and how the rock steady came. Because one of the ones I like is that they, in Jamaica they were they could get on the radio. They got um, Miami radio stations and they heard the the um, like think about you can't hurry love. And if you got a little tinny AM radio, most of the thing you're gonna hear you can't 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 can't. That's what you're gonna hear on this tiny little radio. And again, this is just one of the theories that I've heard. in a ska band there was nothing it's not much in San Diego and I wanted to play some original tunes and have some fun and so it took me like about a year and a half to find enough musicians and that band became a donkey show the first band was in high school in 81 82 it was called the zones we just used to mix it up we loved everything so we played everything whether it was stuff we were writing you know we'd write reggae tunes we'd write these big ska epics and that was before there was any kind of scene that we knew about was that with donkey show when I was you know, 18, 19 years old, they had these big shows in L.A. where they would have like 500, 700 people, you know, like a 1,000 people at these things. They would get together like five or six bands and they call it a mod ska fest. We didn't discover that there was any kind of scene until 80, 85, 86, where we found this flyer with this guy dressed, as it turns out, it was Steve LaForge, the keyboard player for the Toasters. It, was, oh, it looks like our friend Wendell. It wasn't, but we turned it over, and on the toasters, so that's kind of when we started crossing the bridge, literally, to, from Brooklyn into uh, Manhattan to see those bands. And the first time I played New York was in 1988 with Donkey Show. I played CBGB's. It was, it was the toasters, Bim Scalabim, and Donkey Show. And we played last for some reason. It was late, you know, I think it was like one in the morning or something, but it was really good. I mean, I'm sure, you know, in retrospect, it was 50 people, you know what I mean? You know, it, 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 CBG is just not that big, and it wasn't sold out, <laughs> you know what I mean? A lot, a lot of CBGBs, uh, the Cat Club, there was, I don't know, 40 Worth. There was a, I don't know, I, think I only played there a couple of times. Stra even the China Club, uptown. Yeah, back then, uh, back then there were lots and lots of little clubs on the Lower East Side, and so pretty early on, uh, Vicky, who was our bass player, worked the door at so CB's now and then, so she got us a gig there on their auditions night, which was Tuesday, and uh, CB's really liked it, so at that point, we got into playing weekends at CB's pretty early on, and after that, we just kind of made that our New York residency. Well, we used to play CBGB's a lot. That was like, that was like the home base of the ska scene in those days. All the shows would be booked together. You'd usually see the Second Step, Beat Brigade, the Toasters, uh, the A-Kings, the Boilers. Credit has to be given to Rob Hingley, a.k.a. Bucket from the Toasters. There was a lot of people playing ska music and related kinds of music, but um, as far as like bringing a lot of these people together into one you know, scene, Rob was really behind that. He put those shows together. It was the Toasters thing, man. He, he was... Toasters would headline and he would invite you on the bill. And that was how it went. But it was a while before other people were doing it without the Toasters. There was this whole big late 80s, mid late 80s ska scene that was kind of playing at CBGB's and it was kind of very punky and like Murphy's Law was into it and you know, it really had an edge and it was dangerous and there'd be fights and it was like a really edgy scene. I think the city was different. It was, it was a bit dirtier. I think it was a bit more dangerous. Well, on the Lower East Side in 1980, 
I mean, you actually have a lot of musicians living there because a lot of the buildings were squats and people's rents were really low. So you had a lot of artists and writers and creative people. At the same time as, you know, all the ska scene coming out of there, it was a huge, huge hardcore scene and a huge, uh, huge disco scene. I mean, you know, the pub we used to hang out at, I mean, Madonna was in there all the time, for example. So there are all types of, all types of people who came out of that melting pot. Um, ska music was just one of them. When you went to see a band, you discovered things in the 80s. It was really, uh, you know, life-changing, mind-blowing. You know, now with reissues and with YouTube and, you know, eBay and all this stuff, you can find the music. You can just type in a certain artist and find it. When I was first getting into reggae, you could not do that. There was no eBay or whatever. A lot of this early Jamaican stuff wasn't readily available. And so people going... take it for granted now, because now it's like, you know, you hop on Soulseek or you torrent something or whatever. To find some reggae, like, you, there were shops in Brooklyn or whatever, but um, to really hear about it if you didn't live in those neighborhoods, like, was really tough. There were a bunch of ska bands in New York from the late 80s, early 90s. It was actually mid 80s to late 80s, who there was a scene, they had created a real scene. That's where the toasters come out of. But that was really starting to peter out. Every year from like 1988 to 1995, oh, ska's gonna be the big next year, it's gonna be the thing. You would always hear that. And then finally, in 1995, next year happened, you know? But people have been saying it, so by, you know, 92, you're like, oh, go fuck yourself, it's not going to happen, whatever. I, if I recall, I woke up one morning, kind of uh, hung over, turned on the TV, and uh, Carson Daly had this show, or whatever at the time, if I recall, on MTV. They put him up in some stupid, like, you know, summer house somewhere, or on the beach somewhere, right? And if I recall, one morning, I wake up, and he's dressed up as a rude boy. You know, with the, like, you know, two-tone, you know, suit and, like, you know, skinny tie and pork pie hat. And, and he must have got, like, all these kids, like, from the ska scene out in California or something. And he got all those kids to start dancing around. And they were playing, you know, Madness or the Specials or whatever. And I was like, wow, you know, what the, what the hell is going on? Grew up going to all the, you know, the days of the... New York City ska mob, you know, Moon Records, all those bands, Meth Scofflees, and of course the Slackers. These showcases at Wetlands where, great, you know, go to Moon Ska, they'd set it up and you'd have 10 bands on the bill and you'd get there at five in the afternoon and then the last band would be going on at midnight. And it seemed like all those bands were kind of psyched to play with each other, you know, the bills were eight bands and, and you know, you'd go and just stay for the whole show and it was awesome. You got a good variety of stuff. There was a lot of activity going on. It was just, Wetlands was the, was the home base for ska music. It was a home base for all the, uh, the moon ska showcases. It just seemed natural, like, yeah, you know, you're at Wetlands and Desmond Decker's backstage or Toots is there. Or... I remember the show that kind of, I think was the turning point in, in this. And, and that means- For the slackers or the end steps? For, the, for just the scene. Oh, uh, okay. It was at the Wetlands and the slackers had just, or they were gonna drop Red Light. I don't know if it had just come out. And their set was the Red Light set. And I remember standing there like, this is the new shit right here. They're just, they're slackers. You can't put them in any bucket. Like you can't tag them in iTunes. I went to see them in, when I was in high school at this place called The Hook. And that was the first time I saw them. And it was like the best show I've probably ever been to. That band's been playing early reggae and rock steady forever. So Slackers were always kind of like, you know, they were, they were good. They were a good New York band and they toured, but um, I didn't have the impression back then that they were going to be, you know, the hold steady band to come out of this stuff. If it wasn't that we were so unimaginative about what to do next, we would have quit the Slackers a long time ago. But we are imaginative with what to do with the Slackers, you know, and we are very stubborn. The band came to be out of a, an old band called the Rabies. One that was a New York band, and then uh, my old band, Sick and Mad, which was a, a punk band from the suburbs. Uh, we were in Sick and Mad, and uh, at one point, he asked me if I wanted to be in a ska band. And uh, I said, what's ska? He got back to me with a tape, one half of which was the specials, and one half of which was the Scatolites. You know, we had a vague knowledge of two-tone, vague, because it wasn't popular. At the time, we, we, were, we were taking from the Special's first album, and we were taking from Madness and uh, a lot of other bands that were related. 
we ended up on the same bill together at TT the Bears one night. It was the Slackers. It might have been Skinner Box as well and Pressure Cooker. And that was probably the first time I saw the Slackers. That's about maybe X amount, maybe five, six, seven months after that, maybe a little less maybe. Uh, Jeremy gave me a call and said, we just recorded a record called Red Light. And we're uh, gonna be touring behind this record. And he said, would you have any interest in, uh, in doing that? And I was looking for a project like that. So he's like, yeah, come on down. Can you, can you leave in a week and a half? And luckily for me, I just finished college and uh, I was substitute teaching of all things and you know, working different jobs or whatever. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know something? I think I can do that. It's weird how I ended up in the band. Because at first I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do this. But then the style of the band became stuff I was more interested in. I hit it off with Vic right away, so like we always had a musical connection happening. Yeah, I was drinking a lot, and then when I when I sobered up from my uh, my self pitying, my girlfriend's leaving me drunk and binge. I was in the Slackers. Also around that time, Jeff Baker had this idea of putting together a band that would play ska, like old ska. Yeah. You know, the Stubborn All-Stars. Jeff Baker had put together Stubborn All-Stars. I think I started playing with around 94, 95, something like that. It wasn't even supposed to be a band, you know. Skinner Box was chugging along, and we, like I said, we were pretty busy. I was like, you know, I still really want to do something more. Jamaican roots and so I just put together this group to make I just wanted to make an EP on the label like on Stubborn Records and put out that's why it's called Stubborn All-Stars that it came out we put it out in the stores and then like two weeks later I got a phone call and say oh this is Fred Feldman at Profile Records why don't you come see me and um, so they were down to put out the record so we got a band together you know I, I had met Django in passing doing Agent 99 gigs with Skinner Box but it was Vic Ruggiero who recommended me, going, hey, this guy, this guy would be a good guitar player. You should get Eddie Ocampo from the Insteps. And I was like, yo, that guy plays drums real good for this music. And oh, Victor Rice is really good on the bass for this, you know? So then I just invited them and, and Vic Ruggiero. So that was that. That was the original lineup of that. 95, the Slackers made a record at Coyote Studios in Williamsburg. The Stubborn All-Star stuff was recorded there. Mm -hmm. Insteps record was made there. Um, and that was where? That was in Williamsburg on North 6th Street. Oh, okay. off I can't of even imagine what that looked like there. Man, we'd have to like walk in teams to the, the bodega just because <laughs> no one wanted to get jacked, you know? Wow. Like, you get off the L train and book. <laughs> wow. They had been here for 10 years already at that point, and they had the most beautiful studio in the world. The Slackers and Stubborn All-Stars recorded it. They got a call from somebody that was asking for a punk trombone player. They immediately thought of Jeff. They said, oh, there's this guy. We know, punk trombone player. I mean, nobody had ever heard of the, con the concept. Punk, I think they'd even asked for like a punk ska or punk reggae trombone player. They called Jeff immediately. But I wound up getting a call from the studio that we had been recording at. And they said, yo, Django, call Rancid, they need trombone. I said, okay. So I went over there, and I gave Tim the Open Season album. He brought a Stubborn All-Stars record to them, and I remember having a feeling about this, like, because Rancid was just starting to blow up, and they had a hit on the radio with Time Bomb. And I remember that it was a two-tone song, and I'd never heard two-tone on the radio that was a current band. So I had a feeling, uh, and I went to the show, and I didn't even see Jeff, and I didn't even meet the band. But I had a feeling that this was an auspicious day. I played with Tim a couple nights, and then, you know, after that, Tim called me up. Stubborn All-Stars got asked to open for Rancid in, in Europe. And it was like, whoa, what? They listened to the record. They listened to it, and they asked us if a ska band would go on tour with them around Europe. So, of course. We went to Europe with them for a month and opened for them there. And then um, when we came back from that, Tim called me and asked me if I would go on Lollapalooza 96 with them and play trombone. And then a little later on, he asked me if we could bring the rest of the horn section and Vic playing organ. So we did that. On Lollapalooza in 1996, they began forming the ideas of Hellcat Records. Rancid was doing great, Epitaph was doing great. 
they started thinking about it. I mean, Tim, you know, was given this opportunity and he was given the full reign to go and, and select bands that he liked and he signed them. You know what I mean? And that was real. That was for real. Like, you know, that had legs. You know, those records under their, the, the, the umbrella of, uh, of Epitaph couldn't get your record out there to these little independent record stores. And of course, me and Vic are feeding like CDs. You know, we got this other band, The Slackers. You really should check it out, you know. I played them all my bands and everything that I could possibly play, I played on the bus for them because they were on a bus. I played them Sick and Mad, I played them The Slackers, I played them my friends' bands, I played them everything. And I said, this is what's happening in, in my life. And I'm a, you know, this, I'm a schmuck, you know? But I, I want to do this. The Slackers took advantage of that situation a lot more than I did. So, you know, Vic and Dave had their own agenda, basically. And um, Tim asked me, like, if I, if I wanted to, like, leave the label that we were on and, and go to Hellcat. And I was like, nah, because Fred is cool to me. But you should sign a Hepcat. <laughs> so th then when Hellcat got started, you know, of course we were like, I think the Slackers were like the fourth or fifth band to get asked us to be signed too. So we were sort of sitting there because we're like, mm, okay, that's cool. I can see why they asked Hepcat. They're doing pretty well. Pie Tasters, yeah, they do pretty well. Mm, I wonder if they're going to ask us. I don't know. <laughs> So they finally, they finally asked us, and we said yes, please, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we were, you know, it was a, it was the perfect timing, when it was that little crest in the wave where there started to be some buzz about ska music, and some or reggae music where bands were starting to reference that, and then all of a sudden Hellcat decided to select a few bands, and we got a van and started touring it right at the right time. After Red Light came out, then we could tour all over the U.S. We did like three U.S. tours back to back to back. What they did was great. What they did for us was fantastic. They made us a world-class band. And they gave me a career. What do you mean how is it benefiting me? It pays my damn rent. I mean, the thing with the Hellcat release is it got it out around the world, so that got us to the next level, and then we struggled around trying to get past that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It all went, it all just figured itself out. All right, so it must have been like 1996. So I wasn't in the Scott Flows anymore. I was playing with Scott Jazz, Mef Scott Stubborn All-Stars. Then I started rehearsing at the Stubborn spot, Virgin City, and it would just become a recording studio as well. That was Skinner Box's rehearsal space on East 3rd Street. <clears throat> I was doing a lot of recording with a lot of different studios at the time, and um, it was kind of always in the back of my mind to buy stuff and, and build it up. And I had actually been picking up little pieces here and there, but after working with uh, Rancid on Lollapalooza, we did a recording for the Beavis and Butthead film. And Tim was very generous again and uh, gave us all a nice little check. It wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was very gracious of him and, and Rancid to give us that much money. It's and that paid well, so I think Django used the money to buy all this equipment. He bought a Yamaha board, and he bought an eight-track Tascam uh, reel-to-reel. -reel. I think I might have already even had the tape deck, but whatever, I was able to like get it from, you know, having a couple pieces of gear to, to having an operational tracking studio. And uh, I, I was still piecing it together. I had a contract to do that Roots and Culture record, which is like 1997, I guess, is when I was working on it. And um, I was working at this studio with an engineer, whatever, whatever, and I was just listening to, we'd recorded several compilation tracks there, and I, I just felt I wasn't really jiving with the engineer and uh, wasn't really thrilled about how the stuff was coming out, and I was like, I could do this myself. Like, let me just get this studio finished, and. I'll just do it myself. So he brought in all this gear, and for two days we set up the stuff, and he showed me how to wire the stuff up. I canceled the, the studio time, and the night before the recording sessions, I called the band, and I was like, don't go to the studio, come to the rehearsal spot. And they are like, what happened? You canceled the recording? I was like, no, we're doing it there. And they were like, okay, this guy lost his mind. Got there early in the morning, and we're just like still putting things together, because it had never recorded yet. So he was running up and down the street. There was like a music store down the block still at that point. 
I'm like, we need these cables. Go get those. <laughs> and he would come back. And by the time he came back, I was like, okay, we need this now. And he just keep running up and down the block buying stuff. I never actually wired up a studio and a tape machine. And he showed me how to spool up the tape and how to route all the wires and the patches and compressors and delays and mics and XLR cables and all this stuff. So that was, for me, that was music school. You know, engineering school was Version City. By the time they got to the studio, we weren't ready to roll yet. So I was like, here, you guys just go buy some Chinese food and hang out for a while. By the time they finished eating, I was like, okay, let's start getting sounds. And that was the first thing that we recorded down there, Roots and Culture. I was going out of town a lot. Um, I gave a key to Victor Rice, and I gave a key to Victor, no, to uh, Agent J. And uh, somehow Victor Ruggiero snuck in there. But he wasn't giving a key. Not only was it a really great studio for rehearsing and recording, it was also a place where we as musicians could kind of mature in, in the style and experiment a little and kind of learn and teach each other how to play reggae. You know, I basically learned how to play rock steady and reggae in that studio, you know? Basically, when I was around, I was in there all the time. So whoever was around would just pop in and stuff was being worked on to be like, oh, you got your horn? Uh, oh, I need a tenor on this, or this, that, and the other thing. It was just on a sidewalk, you know, on 3rd Street and 1st Avenue, where just people in town, random musicians would just, oh, the, the space is open, let's just go down there and see who's there. And it's like anarchist reggae free-for-all on those records, and it's great. The gates would be open, and Victor Rice probably be there mixing something, or Agent J was there. Uh, so a lot of people cut their teeth, I guess, being part of that studio, sure. engineer-wise, sound, you know, sound-wise, and, and uh, in terms of musicianship. It was like a physical place for people to hang out, and it was on the same block as Jammy Lab. So there was a source of musicians coming to the block for a different reason, and it was also the same block for the. Uh, the Hells Angels headquarters. So the police weren't coming to that block because it was probably the safest block in town, you know? Oh, uh, I mean, there was a lot of shenanigans going on in that place. Victor Rice dumping a, <laughs> a pint of Guinness into a box of white T-shirts, maybe. Vic Ruggiero, like, being caught sleeping in there with the rats and stuff. There was a, that's one thing about that place. <laughs> uh, you know, you'd see rats running around every now and then, so at some point, um, there was this guy, Nick, uh, who was kind of the super of the building and stuff, and he liked us there, and, you know, we never messed with his stuff, so he was cool with us, but there was so many rats. You know, one summer there was like a real rat epidemic in the East Village, so he put out all these rat traps. Basically, all the, the rats were killed by all this rat poison and rat paper. So we'd try and go down there to work, and it would just reek of, like, dead rats, like, to the point of nausea where it like hurt to be down there. It stank so bad. <laughs> it was just reeked of rotting, decaying rats. And then of course within days, there were like biblical swarms of flies. So we would literally open these like metal, metal shutters off the sidewalk and like, I, when I say biblical amounts of flies, it was black with flies and it would just come out and it was just like, Holy shit, we have work to do down there. There is literally 50 trillion flies in this studio, and it's still reeked of dead rats. Well, people were doing all kind of funny shenanigans to me. A lot of my gear was vanishing. A lot of my gear was being broken. Um, people were charging other people to record them there and not giving me any money for it, and I was paying all the rent. Basically, people were just screwing around a lot and not really finishing anything, so... I was paying for it. I was buying reels all the time. There was no finished product or very little. And, uh, you know, a lot, like a lot of my stuff disappeared and walked out of there while, while people were recording. When the landlord finally sold the building, we literally had to go around the back alley and break in through the back to get out the equipment. So I just was done. And, you know, at that time also, my, uh, my apartment in the Lower East Side, I've been living there for like 10 years. Um, it was a, a sublet, and the guys that actually, you know, had the rights to the apartment were like, well, one of our kids is going to go to college, and we're going to give it to him, so you got to get out. So I just packed up everything and split. So once Virgin City was closed in New York, um, 
it was really, it wasn't even like that. It was just, it just, it was the mark of what was actually going on. All the musicians were leaving Manhattan because uh, there was no way to afford the real estate, there's no way to afford the rent, you know, in Manhattan. So all the artists were actually moving away from the center of town. And it was a totally different vibe, you know what I mean? Even in the last 10 years with real estate going as it is, you know, we talk about real estate. And you've seen the city change so fast and become so expensive um, that, yeah, that, you know, the artists aren't really there anymore. Um, and, and it was no longer convenient. There was no longer a, a, the spontaneity was gone. You had to make arrangements if you wanted to run into somebody, you know? It, that whole thing kind of affected, um, you know, live music in the city, you know, real estate with, it was like Giuliani had this, um, can I go there even? We talk about Giuliani. Yeah. Right, so, talk about Giuliani. All right, so Giuliani had these cabaret laws that he enforced where people couldn't, you couldn't dance in a club. It was like Footloose in New York City, you know? It's this crazy law, like if more than two people are dancing somewhere, yeah, yeah. you, get you have to have a cabaret license. True, right. The Giuliani years really did a number on the music venues. A lot of them lost their license or gentrification happened in Manhattan so that, like, Wetlands is now, what, a furniture place? So there was that, there was uh, no smoking in the clubs. So everybody was forced to be outside where they'd be mingling and talking and whatever, they were drunk probably and having a good time being loud. And then there, those clubs would feel pressure too. Used to be all the venues in Manhattan were where the ska shows happened, but Brooklyn is sort of the center of the scene now. This knitting factory moved and there was a whole big change with that. Losing that club definitely was, it was a shitty thing. And at the same time, it was such a great thing because we did get forced into the underground. We went back to throwing house parties. I think the best answer for anyone who's asked us what are the reggae and ska shows like in New York, I would have to say come to either a dirty reggae party, a Virgin City party, or a, a night at Otto's, a Thursday night. All those different shows have this certain environment to them where you can tell everybody's there for the same reason. It feels like a party with a live band and DJs between bands and not just a show where people show up and they're watching the bands and then they stand around bored between bands or you know they run out to their cars to have a drink. This is like a party. People are there not just to dance but to like talk to each other and to hang out. I think it was, it must have been 2009 Sammy Kay from the Fourth Rights wanted to do an after-show party. They were playing, I think, Bowery Poetry Club in the city. They wanted to do an after-show party because that was 21 plus, so they couldn't hang out there. They were like, hey man, could you set up some kind of like underground, like, you know, an underground space we can do like an after-show party? And I was like, uh, okay, let me make some calls. And I called around. I had just met Chris from the lake and he, we were gonna do it there. I needed a name for the night, so I was just like, it was reggae bands, but it was kind of in this kind of punky space. They had to move it to this other space called Glass Door, which was even more rough around the edges. And we brought in turntables and did the whole thing. And that was the first dirty reggae party. And then some people came out. It was a cool party. And, you know, again, it was an underground space, so there was no obnoxious bouncers. There was whatever it was a free vibe, and people respected it. So we did one, you know, a month or so later, and then we moved it back to the lake. And, uh, you know, we were originally going to do it, but that people came out to that. That was cool. And uh, so it's just been snowballing since then. It doesn't feel like a show as much, because it's kind of just all these bands that are friends playing, taking turns getting up on stage. The lake is a really cool, dirty, fun place to play. First of all, it's like almost impossible to find. It's just a blank door, really, in the middle of nowhere in Brooklyn. And then you go up a long staircase, and then you're at a freaking awesome party. It looks like somebody like punched through the wall and was like, all right, that's going to be, that's the sound board there. <laughs> it's the sound booth. It's this corner of the room. You can go on that street. There's no cars parked outside. You'd never even know that something's happening. You know? You go there and it's just somebody's living space, but there's this really cool stage in it, and there's a whole like backyard area where you're there in the summer, you can go down the steps, and there's different rooms, and uh, so you can sort of travel through this little community and talk to different people. Uh, and it has more of a uh, sort of home feel to it, and so in that way it's kind of great as like a home base for this stuff. Playing there and being there makes, that's the way it should feel. Like, that's what I think of a show, and what I always imagined a show to be like. There was one time 
Jeremy from Deadly Dragon was DJing with John and I at the lake. So he was going to wheel up a tune and I guess got so excited about how good the tune was that he wheeled himself off of the DJ booth. Like, wheeled the record back and went back. Fell about five or six feet off of the platform backwards. We looked up, the song wasn't playing and there was no DJ. <laughs> it's, it's policed by the people who come to the show and the, you know, the people at the door. It's not because there's an oppressive security force in your face. It's a, it's a community, community self-policing. Oh, and you've been to the lake? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get everybody to describe the lake in five words. Um, obscure. Stairs. Packed. Sweaty. Smoky. Busy. Boozy. Latino. <laughs> loud. It's very loud in that place. Electric. It's a great self-regulated party. Vomit. DIY is as obvious. Strange. Inspiring. Shithole that I love. Smelly is a word that you might that other people may have used, but I don't think it smells that bad. But you know, welcoming. Talk about autos. Autos is cool. Autos is really weird. I mean autos auto shrunken head has free shows all the time, but specifically Thursday nights in the front room they have reggae DJs. Jail point in a Jay's DJ gig, as well as, uh, you know, Rata and everybody else will DJ there. I feel really fortunate that there's a place where I can go and listen to other people pick out the songs I'm going to listen to on a fairly regular basis. A lot of, like, big nights have happened for me there, and they've been really kind to, like, kind of continue to host it. It's a little more accessible. Again, um, I have friends who would go to, uh, go to autos because it's a club, you know, with a guy checking IDs at the door versus like a dirty reggae party, which, you know, a little bit off the beaten path. I'm just happy that I have a variety of places to play uh, where a variety of people can come to see me play. There's like never a dull moment at these parties because there'll be a band playing and then as soon as they're done, the selector will hit it up with a like big track, you know, and he'll play right up to the second the band starts again. I feel like it's just like glue. Like you don't want, you know, you don't want there to be like 20 minutes of dead air between set changes, and you don't want to be listening to like grindcore or whatever the fuck. Like, I'm sorry if you like grindcore, but I don't even know what that is. I've been DJing for a little while, I guess. I'm, I'm a little bit different because I play like strictly 45s. It just seems like that's the only way I could do it. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not a really computer type of person. Owning the record is just like, I don't know, man. It's like it's like owning a piece of stock in that song or something, you know. Grace is one the youngest DJ in New York, I think. I thought I was, but then I found out she was younger than me. Well, she grew up with a, she grew up with a lot of vinyl, so yeah, she has a, lot a of very vinyl. strong background and like she's a killer solo DJ of, too, yeah, you know. Yeah. Anytime somebody's asked me, you know, how to become a good DJ or, you know, what's what's the secret? There isn't really any secret other than just learning your records. You know, you love them, so you play them over and over again. You know exactly where that record skips, exactly where to cut it, you know, and that's the whole, like, real love behind records for me, is learning the records and knowing it like the back of my hand. It's funny to see people's reactions sometimes, like, little white girl playing reggae music. This is interesting. That's never gonna get old, <laughs> I think. I like the running a certain rhythm. I like matching the beat when I can, when I have it together enough, and when the turntables are fast enough where I can do that. Um, I like keeping the set moving, where it's like if you can do that and just keep the energy going, where like right when people are at that edge, if you just drop in that next drum fill or that next tune and like drop in some killer tune they've never heard before that they're like, what is this? But the beat comes in so hard they just can't deny it. And then you drop in some classic tune right when they're, you're playing all this rare hard shit that they're loving, then you drop the side they know and then the place goes nuts. Like that's what I like to try and, I, sometimes I can do it, a lot of times I can't. Me and Chucky in particular, we like, we don't want anybody to steal our tunes, so we're scratching the labels out now. 
<laughs> There's some like competition going on for sure, but I, it's all friendly. It's great competition. DJs like to be very competitive with each other. We don't want anyone to know. Like I don't want anyone to know what I'm spinning. Like my favorite records, I just like how they did in Jamaica. Scratch my records off, you know. Some DJs will find out what you're spinning. Yeah, and they will make sure to have that shit too. They'll play that before you. It's not, you know the late 60s, 70s, or 80s. Nowadays, it's like you could shazam it right on your phone and, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of silly. And then, yeah, we have, we, we have gigs here. Like, me and Maddie do it all the time, you know? It's like the first to spin it. Otherwise, the second person can't spin it. It's like, just like, there's like rules involved. I don't know, sometimes I scratch the records label off, you know? But then there's always the blank ones. You gotta check the blank ones. Pinto is a person who I know he spins sometimes without any labels. He has like the blank style. Dude, New York has a billion, billion, G you know, DJs. We have a lot of selectors and we have a lot of DJs. Have you ever been to Mush One's uh, Alparagus parties? But he has a party every month. I mean, every season besides summer because it gets too hot, but like that, like my Jamaican idols come to you, like Lady Anne, Johnny Osborne, Carlton Livingston, like people that I can't imagine being that close to. Yeah. Just in your like, just hanging out, you know, like. Whatever, man. A lot of people could like drop a record and just be like, all right, you know, I got this record. I'll play it for you. You know, certain people in, in a certain environment could play that exact same record and like, explode a fucking, you know, explode the fucking dance hall. You know, there's also the Deadly Dragon crew, which is, um, Deadly Dragon is a record store. Only Jamaican music. Those guys have a night every week, too, that I try to go to as much as I can, and they play everything, man. You'll catch Queen Majesty or, you know, Jeremy Freeman or, you know, any of those guys. Just the whole crew, they all fucking know this music better than fucking anybody would. You know, Scratch Famous from Deadly Dragon, his knowledge in fucking reggae music is like, you know, very deep. And so he has like a lot of unbelievable tunes, obviously. He fucking runs Deadly Dragon, that's the shit. The greatest thing about him is that like, whatever, he could play Israelites, you know, the, you know Desmond Decker's Israelites, like a very common whatever song. And, and I, I've, I've, I've shared this with him before is that you know, maybe I played Israelites the same night, you know, in a different venue and whatever, and people listened to it, maybe some people danced. But in a Deadly Dragon party, let's say he dropped the same tune an hour later, and the fucking room explodes, and he has to bring it back like six times because there's fucking eight assholes in the corner and just keep telling him to forward it and forward it and forward it. It's nice that all these DJs come together to spin for AJ and Rocksteady and Ska and like have all that kind of stuff in common. Like all these DJs that I know are like all buddies and we're all cool with each other and we all always have a good time keep spinning together. You know, it makes it more fun, you know? Like some, sometimes autos is literally like just the DJs taking turns spinning and we all have a good time, you know? Yeah, geez, like, is there anywhere else in the world that people just, like, party and listen to Rocksteady, like, play Rocksteady music? At some point when I was listening to all this Jamaican music at my house and, like, really enjoying it, I was like, I think I'm, like, starting to get a little crazy, you know what I mean? Why are we listening to much reggae music, you know? And then I went to these reggae shows and I'm like, these people are listening to the same music I'm listening to at home, you know? Like, I remember how happy I was to find a place that I could actually hang out with my friends and they're playing the tunes that I love and like I get drink and like dance and like see bands perform the same type of music, you know? It's like, it's great, you know? Within, I guess, probably the past three years or so, bands like The Frighteners, The Hard Times, The Fourth Rights, almost every, every other weekend you got something going on. The Frighteners really impressed me because I knew them all as guys who were just coming to shows and hanging out and then all of a sudden they had a band. They were all people, you know, who'd been coming in and out of shows, uh, Dan and Chuck and everybody. I was very um, surprised when I saw them the first time. They show up looking like the fucking Rat Pack in nice suits, and they have that swagger, that fucking Rat Pack swagger, like Sinatra had, you know? So when I first met Dan a couple of times, he, like, would toast a little to the selectors. And that time, I remember specifically, like, he sounded really good with the selector at the time. We got along really well, like, our music taste was very similar at the time, and, like, the things we would want to 
play in a band sounded like almost like exact. I had just asked Dan that day if he'd like want to be in a band and he was totally down and I told him, all right, I'm gonna call you in a couple weeks. I'm gonna try to get a band together. Live show, it's fucking all Little Dan. Little Dan is just a great front man, man. Like, I don't know, it feels like he's like, it feels like he's yelling at God or something. It's really cool to watch him perform. It's one of those things like when Dan sings about a broken heart, you feel those tears rolling down his face. You believe what he says. Three years ago, I was like, I really want to try to like spit some lyrics on this rhythm. You know, I'm singing in the shower, walking down the street, singing my favorite reggae tunes. And he was playing some awesome shit and I just really wanted to get on there and try and I did. And it was like, oh, wow, I can do this. This is pretty cool, you know? And then every time I got a chance with like shockwave sound or crazy ball head, I'd get on the microphone. I'd, and uh, the hard times, I sang a couple of tunes with them very early on. Uh, and that really helped me get a sense of, of how to like hold a microphone and be in front of people, you know? And at a certain point, yeah, I met these guys who were all out of the Queens area. And uh, and it was like, and not only did we like reggae, but we were really interested in a certain period of reggae. You know, it was like, it was like oh, meeting a bunch of 20 something year olds who were like nice people. And uh, they're really interested in like Studio One, 60s stuff. So it, was like, it wasn't just like we liked reggae, you know? Cause like you, you can be into like dub and, and some raga jungle techno yeah. shit, and I could be into like blue beat ska and rocksteady, and it's like you know I'm in '68 and you're in Planet Mars. <laughs> we're not. We were all like, yo, 1968, Sugar Mine, Alton yeah, Ellis. You know, we were like on the same page. We want to make a certain kind of reggae, and we want to stick to the. Which is you know, what I think our binding factor is that we share our common like taste and a common vibe. Chucky, got his gold organ. We opened up his organ a couple months ago and it's like, I don't know where he got it from, but it's like these like super delicate wires that just barely touch this like contact. I don't know like who whoever thought this would be a good way to make it, make a piano, but it like it has this light touch and that's the way he plays and it really comes through. Who plays this great like organ that he has like little distortion on his organ and he more than anyone like epitomizes what I call like dirty reggae, you know, because they, you know, he really has that like kind of making reggae punk and kind of making punk reggae. And we got some things that you haven't seen yet, man. Yeah. We're, we're gonna try new things like Calypso. We're gonna try Calypso. Calypso. You know, we're gonna try some blue beats, some like very R and B, like like the the beginning of ska. Yeah. Like just blues. stay true to vintage Jamaican music, you know, like really yeah. like let it shine. The hard times was Bob Tim, who's been around I guess since the de facto's was like a mid-90s New York kind of ska band, and he's been around for a while. That's his band with, I guess, Jerrica, who was in the Scofflaws, and a couple other people. I got a lot of respect for the hard times um, for doing, I think, something that a lot of the people who are playing now have thought about doing, but have been a little bit too afraid to, is playing primarily instrumentally. And they're mostly instrumental, kind of funky, like skinhead reggae, mostly organ you know, instrumental kind of stuff. You know, we put the band together. The first thing Bob did was send out all these, uh, you know, tunes for us to learn. And a lot of them were instrumentals. They were like these classic reggae instrumentals. So that was just sort of like the material we were working from. And we were never really aggressively looking for a singer. A lot of the bands we were modeling ourselves after um, were these bands that were just sort of studio backing bands or live backing bands, you know, where it was, somebody and the such and suches. Well, we were the such and suches. If anybody was gonna do it, I'm glad they did because I think they definitely got it right. I think they are a tight enough band where you can sit and watch a whole set of them playing these tunes that don't necessarily have any vocals and, you know, not get bored of it. Playing with them has really changed my keyboard playing because I'm thinking more rhythmically in the way I play. And Bob and Jake are awesome as well. Jake, Jake will play you a skank literally all day long, which is exactly what you're looking for in a guitar player. It's the hardest thing to do is to just play what the music needs. They, they can all do that, which is cool. And they have great rhythms, and it's fun playing with them, and it's easy to write with them. I definitely remember like seeing the hard times and being like, like I felt like they popped up out of nowhere. I did not know Jerrica. I did not know Jacob Wake Up. Uh, I didn't know any of those guys. I did not know any of them. So they came up and they played and all this awesome music, like dead on skinhead reggae. Like they were, you know, playing a lot of upsetters and really awesome, like skinhead reggae stuff, a lot of early reggae. And 
some cool rock steady stuff also, and they were nailing it. No Hard Times show is exactly the same. You know, we sometimes, we've, we're fortunate we have singers who come and do a song with us or um, somebody gets up and chats on a, on a song we're doing. Um, one of our strengths is that if somebody gets up on stage, we can sort of work around them. They're just a fun band to watch in general because you can see all of them are having a good time. The, the Hard Times were doing a lot of great things, um, but the you know, unfortunate thing is sometimes somebody falls in love and has to move to another state. And that's a beautiful thing. We've been playing with the Fourth Rights for a couple of years now. They're definitely like a big inspiration to us. It, it's really fun to like try to one up your friends and, and bring out the best in each other through that friendly, competitive vibe. I moved to New York and and I just gotten, gotten uh, dumped and like was depressed and in a brand new city and like didn't know anybody and was having a really hard time. Like I'd go to shows and stuff and couldn't make any friends, like any like like real friends. So I was like, well, I'll just start a band and then they have to hang out with me. I met Sammy K years and years ago while I was still playing with uh, the Fed. His band was playing the Trash Bar. And I was like, oh, I want to be in that band. I wish I could be in that band. And I had met Jack and Matt at uh, a Slacker show at the Bowery Ballroom. And so I just had this in my head that, well, if Jack moves from guitar to piano and Sammy goes from pick guitar to bass, that I could work my way into this band to play guitar, which is what I wanted to do from the first time I saw them. I never played bass until they said, hey, you get, you're, you're, you're a bass player now. We got the opportunity to go on tour with Vic Ruggiero from The Slackers and Chris Murray from King Apparatus. Two people who've been living the music for their basically their adult lives. We were their backing band playing old tunes of, of, of Vic's that we, that we were fans of from the Sick and Mad stuff to the, the Scandalous All-Stars stuff. It was a trip to be able to play those songs and even and Chris Murray's tunes, it was, it was like uh, taking a class on, on reggae music. I think the Vic and Chris tour did a lot of good for the Fourth Rights, but I think that, you know, after that, it became more apparent that people wanted to do different things. Towards the end of the tour, with Vic Ruggiero and Chris Murray, we stopped in Niles, Ohio, uh, at this guy Nate's house. We recorded at, um, at in, a, in an attic in Ohio with, with Nate, and it was like a complete clusterfuck, and then it like worked out and it was all live, and they both played with us, which was really fun. The recording had a feel to it, and the, the session had a feel to it, which was something that I hadn't experienced before. And it's since doing that, it's something that I've been striving for. Maddie is very cool. Maddie was definitely one of our first experiences outside of New York of someone who was doing exactly what we were trying to do. On my way to Europe with my other band, we stopped in New York on the way, and I played a show with the Fourth Rights. I was in Europe with FTA and things were great, but I kept thinking about the fourth ride. Just messaged her one day on Facebook and said, yo, like, you're in New York often, like, next time you come, we'll try and book a show around it. We'll play four or five songs in our set. We'll get we'll get a longer set and do, you know, Maddie Ruthless and the fourth rights. The fourth rights of Maddie Ruthless. And, and when uh, my work with Father and Albert, when they kind of dissipated a little bit, uh, the Fourth Rights asked me to go on tour with them, and we went on a full national tour together in a 1988 Dodge club wagon. And we didn't really, we had like kind of a radio and no AC. <laughs> we went from Chicago to Texas, Texas to California, California to the Midwest, and then back to New York. And so it was incredible. I wanted to do a tour with the, with the Fourth Rights and We Are The Union, putting a traditional band with a ska punk band. Uh, I, I kind of got the idea from when the Slackers took on the music industry on tour. Playing for the ska punk scene was interesting and fun, and uh, it's completely different than what we were trying to do. But like, it's interesting to see how there is a connection there, and I guess people who like one are supposed to like the other. Started in Indianapolis, we met We Are The Union there. We worked our way down to New Orleans for the Community Records block party. And we played on the street outside of the Big Top. And it was a whole lot of fun. 
We played sometime in the middle of the day. I think it was like 4, 4.20. That was a lot of fun. That, that, that was uh, one of the last really good times I had playing with that band, like having a blast playing on stage. We ended up back in Indianapolis and we were gonna drive to Cleveland. And when we left Indianapolis, we were about like 30 miles away and the van just crapped out. We didn't know what it was. Uh, it turns out it was the radiator had cracked and we needed a new one and it was like Friday afternoon when this happened. After we blew up the van and scrounged up enough money and borrowed money to get it fixed. And at that point, everybody's credit cards were maxed out. And we were just like, what was a successful tour up until a breakdown? On the last day, on the way to the last show, you know, we were going home that night. We were gonna sleep in our beds, like we were gonna show up at home in the morning. It cost us basically the rest of the money that we had to get, to get the van fixed and that we can get ourselves home. Uh, a couple of us went out of pocket for gas and tolls and whatever, getting the way home. We played a show with Bad Manners at the Webster, the studio at Webster Hall, and that was the last show of that tour. The set was really good. I was having a good time, and then something went sour throughout that night, you know, between myself and Jack, which, at this point, it, we, were, we were butting heads kind of a lot. Uh, pretty often, we were butting heads by this point. I really don't even know what happened, why he left. I still, to this day, don't know whether if, if he quit or if he got fired or if there were fights and bullshit arguments. And I'm, I'm a short-tempered person. And I was, I just didn't want to get into it with anybody anymore. I never did that whole tour. I kept my mouth shut and I was really cool and level-headed and I let them do the fight and because I, I was I was having the time of my life. I was playing music every night for that tour with the breakdown in the end. It was like 70 days. I was I was away from my home for 70 days playing music, you know? I was in heaven. Like I said, Jack and I were butting heads. Matt and I were butting heads. I felt myself growing growing away, shying away from, from the band in general. I, I quit over a broken heart. That's why I left the band. Jim was gone. Jim was not in the band anymore. And, you know, they asked me to let Maddie play, you know, give her a chance. I wasn't really for it. And we did these shows and I came home and I was just unhappy. The forthrights were doing so many great things for a while. And everybody kind of always wanted to do different things. Everyone always had their own ideas and opinions. And it just kind of, it came to a point where I think it, people just had to go do those other things. If nobody else wanted to jump on the bandwagon, then it was time to do your own thing. I think that there's a lot of good things coming right now from the Far East, who is, it's a makeshift forthright. There's gonna be just as much good things coming from them. Jimmy Doyle and the engineers are gonna be doing some fun stuff. And, you know, Sammy Kay is out in California, is doing a tour, and I think everybody everybody's figuring out where they're supposed to be, and the forthrights was what they had to do then to figure that out. For a lot of these bands to, you know, go out of their way to find places on their own to help not only their own bands, but their friends' bands, is not something that's necessarily been done before here. You know, it's always there in different ways, you know, in uh, DIY punk shows and stuff, but as far as people playing ska, rocksteady, and like different um, variations of classic reggae music, I don't think you could find it anywhere else like it is here. When I'm down, I listen to this music. When I'm in a good mood, I listen to this music. When I've had like a rough work at my office job, and I have a really great office job, but like it's still like 
an office job. At the end of the week, it's like, ah, oh, there's a show I can go to, or there's like, I've got a gig, and it's going to be OK. For, for years, there wasn't, there wasn't like a scene for this, you know? There was something that was like this like 90s ska, third wave revival. And that, that was kind of really dying down. So for punk and reggae to kind of come back and converge in Brooklyn at this time really meant a lot to me. Because there was many years where the people that were teaching me about reggae were considerably older than me. And I was like this one punk rock kid with my friends who was listening to this kind of music. And it was like, OK, then. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I had to wait like 10 years to meet a bunch of other people. Everyone's desire to help everybody else out. It's not just about me and getting my band to the next level. It's about getting this music to the next level and getting this really great music that we all care a lot about in front of more people. To see a bunch of bands that have come up in the last X amount of years that are doing this music with a lot of heart and soul, being a part of that community of, of musicians now is great. I was born and bred here in Brooklyn. And to me, it's always been, I was never, ever, ever bored, meaning there's there's just all sorts of people to look at. There's, also, there's always something to hear. There was always something to do. It's just a big mixture of beautiful, to me, of beautiful things. And from the architecture to the people coming from the West Indies, from you know, the, the Irish neighborhoods and the Italian neighborhoods. You know, and and it's, it's not so big that you can't get around. So to me, the beauty part of the whole Brooklyn scene is that uh, if they want to be from here, they should take from here and you know, take what, to me, what Brooklyn's all about is just a big mix of uh, wonderful things. And even if you stick with that and you put that in, you're good to go. I'm not originally a Brooklyn uh, lover. To me, it's hard to get around Brooklyn. Brooklyn is dark and cold, and, you know, everybody's flocking to Brooklyn as a, as a new mecca. It's not really my style, you know? But it's, it's a lot of people, it's fulfilling the dream of what people need right now. And if that's what New York is doing for people, then I support it because New York's always been a palette. It's always been a blank page for people to create on, you know? And far be it from me to take any claim to this place because it's not, it's a lot bigger than me and it's a lot bigger than my friends. I think the coolest part is that everybody's into a little bit of a different thing. Everybody has their own style. All the DJs I know, everyone has their own style. All the vocalists I know, they all have their own style. And come together, we've got Brooklyn Rocksteady. Wow, 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 wow.